propose for the next few days to talk about a, an infamous subject called biblical criticism, or sometimes called the higher biblical criticism or sometimes called documentary hypothesis. Um, this is a theory about where what we call the five books of Moses came from. Where did they come from? Who authored them? How did it achieve its current form? And this is the very rage in academia by far, the majority position has been so for 70, 80 years. Um, I propose to describe it to you and then to examine it critically um, to see uh, the extent to which it really has any support. The idea is this. Our five books of Moses is the result of combining fragments, much older texts, fragments, written at different times by different people. And at a certain point in history, an editor sewed them together, combined them together into the form that we see now. Why should anybody think that? Where would such an idea come from? Well, there are four main areas of evidence that they offer in favor of this idea. First of all, and this is what triggered the idea in the first place, you find differences of style in different places in the book. Chief among them is the name of God. There are different names of God. And then... Verbs are used in different ways. For example, a woman gives birth. What does a man do? Well, in some texts, a man causes there to be a birth. Yalad is to give birth. In Hebrew, to cause a birth is holid. And sometimes a man is described as being molid. Other places, the same verb that's used for a woman is used for a man. Yalad. Or numbers. When you have a high number, how do you write it? 120 and 7? 7, 20, and 100? Suppose you're counting year. Is it 127 years? Or 100 years and 20 years and 7 years? Or 7 years and 20 years and 100 years? You have variations of that type. And sentence structure. Are the sentences simple sentences or compound, complex sentences? How long are they? Are they poetical or plain, elaborate or simple? How much detail is, is there? What kinds of adjectives are used? In one place, the Torah describes God as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In another place, the Torah describes God as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. There's two ways to link God to the patriarchs. That's one type of evidence. Variations in style. Another type of evidence is contradictions. There are, at least in superficial reading, passages that contradict one another. A third type of evidence is redundancy. The same material appears more than once. Sometimes it's legal material, sometimes it's narrative, and the same material appears more than once. A fourth type of evidence is where the text discusses a subject that's politically or socially sensitive. And you can trace that text to the historical period in which this issue was politically and socially sensitive. So, for example, one text describes the position of the king, his rights, his obligations. Another, several, discuss the position of the, of the Kohen, of the priest, privileges and our responsibilities of a Kohen. 
Now, these four types of evidence are supposed to bear on the authorship of the text in the following way. Let's go back through them again. Let's consider names of God. Names of God express conceptions of God. The names of God are not just ciphers, A, B, C, D. They express qualities that God has. Presumably, so the argument goes, you have a conception of God, attached to that conception is a quality. What kind of God do you believe in? What kind of God do you worship? Different names imply different conceptions. Different conceptions usually are possessed by different communities, different groups with different conceptions of God. So, if you have in one big book passages written with one name and passages with another name, a natural way to understand that is there were different communities with different conceptions of God, and those communities had their writers. And a passage with one name of God represents the authorship of someone in the community that had that conception. A passage with a different name of God represents authorship of a person in that community. And there you have evidence that there are different pieces of the book that are written by authors in different communities. Same with verbs and numbers and adjectives and sentence structure. A writer has a style. And when you find varying styles within one text, it's reasonable to think that you had varying authors, each author with his own style. Contradictions. Why would there be an open contradiction in a text? Isn't the writer trying to make himself understood? Does the writer really want the reader to throw up his hands and say, oh, I can't make sense out of this, it's a gobbledygook? Presumably not. Well, here's the solution. The text with one half of the contradiction was written by one writer. The text with the other half of the contradiction was written by a different writer. Each writer was writing for his own group. Each writer's piece was perfectly consistent. And the editor just sewed it all together. Same with redundancy. Usually, people don't write the same thing more than once. Maybe you're a scribe being paid by the word. You'd like to make it longer. But if you're composing a text and you want people to read it and remember it, understand it, you don't just add on over and over again. That being the case, if there's redundancy, again, the same solution suggests itself. This account of the law or the narrative, this account was written by a different writer. And the editor sewed it all together, leaving in the fact that the same thing is expressed twice. <clears throat> and the fourth is even more obvious. If, for example, the description of the king, his rights and responsibilities, is tied to the time when the Federation of Tribes changed its political structure and became unified under a king, which was about 400 years after the Exodus. So, uh, these texts were created to describe, to govern, to give a basis for that new transition, that political transition. Uh, when the priests became ascendant, when the priests achieved their privileges and their responsibilities, that's when the texts describing the position of the priests were created. So then, these, these texts were created in different historical periods, different times. Of course, that means different populations. How they're related to the other separate populations is not exactly clear, but definitely you have different writers creating these different texts. That's the outline of how the theory works. You end up with the idea that there are multiple authors from different groups at different times, and then all amalgamated into a single text by an editor at some point in time. Okay, is that, is that reasonably clear? Okay, now let me introduce you to a little idea of philosophy of science. You're a scientist, and you're trying to find evidence for a theory. This never happens in a vacuum. This never happens in a vacuum. What you have is competing theories. And when you're looking for evidence, 
What you want is evidence that helps resolve the competition. If you have three theories, let's say A, B, and C, and you're looking for evidence for A, what you really want is something that supports A against B and C. What good will it do you if you find a piece of evidence that supports A, but also supports B and C? In terms of what the question you're facing, which of the three should I adopt, this helps you not at all. What you're really looking for when you look for evidence is evidence for one that's against the other competing hypotheses. And that determines, to a, a, a considerable extent, what evidence you'll find relevant. So, to do things right, thoroughly, when you talk about having a hypothesis, and you talk about evidence, the first question you ought to ask is, what are the competitors? What are the competitors? The hypothesis we are discussing asserts that there are multiple human authors for the book that we call the Five Books of, Mo of Moses. Multiple human authors and an editor who sewed it together. Let's see if we can think of relevant alternatives that that hypothesis could be played off against, and then we can assess the evidence that we're gathering. Any thoughts about what could be relevant competitors? Yeah. One human author? Yeah. How about single human author? That's definitely a competitor. Any else? Any other idea that could possibly be relevant to some people? Group of, huh? A group of well, rabbis, I guess, sitting around the table, writing it. I mean, instead of doing it from different groups and different... Okay, I mean, a variation of multiple human authorship, not the kind of multiple human authorship that they're describing. Okay, I didn't think of that, but that's an interesting alternative. Yeah? Any other possible alternative that one might think of? Divine author. Yeah, how about God? You know, I mean, that's... Certainly a possibility, and it's something which a lot, a lot of people take seriously. So I think we've got to put that into the, you know, on the table with the alternatives we are considering. Okay, now the first point that I want to uh, explain to you, and in a way this is the single most important point, is that all the evidence that I described is relevant in competition between multiple human authorship and single human authorship. That's where it's relevant. I'm not saying it's great. I'm just saying it's relevant. How good it is, we'll talk about it in a while. But it's relevant to multiple human versus single human. It's not relevant to divine authorship. It's not relevant. It doesn't count one way or the other. It's just out of court. Let me show you why that's true. Now we'll go back to the Evans a third time. And this time I'm going to pick up a crucial element in how the evidence works. So there are different names of God. And what did we say? Well, the name of God expresses a conception of God. And typically, a person or a group has its conception of God. If you have multiple names, multiple conceptions, then typically, what you're talking about is different human groups. Okay, notice the main premise here is human psychology. We're talking about how human beings think, and how human groups relate to one another, and how much unanimity and integration there is in a human group. The main premise here is we're describing normal human psychology. Let's take verbs. Authors have their vocabulary. Typically, we'll be told, an author uses a verb in one way. If there are different ways, contrasting ways, one author doesn't do that. What are we talking about? We're talking about styles of human authorship. That relies, relies on what we know about human beings who write books. So here's how the logic goes. Would one person have different concepts of God? Different concepts in one person? Very unlikely. What am I relying on? Human psychology. Would one author have different styles of writing? Let's check the books and see whether single authors have different styles of writing, different uses of verbs, and so on and so on. No? What am I relying on? The way in which human beings write books. So now, if you imagine the competition between multiple human authorship and single human authorship, this evidence is relevant. It's evidence that this is done the way different human authors would do it. It isn't done the way in which one human author would do it. Okay, now let's try pushing it upstairs. And if God were writing a book, how many names would he choose for himself? 
how would you know? How would you test it? You don't know God's psychology. Can you break into his library and find his private diaries and see how he expresses himself and then compare the style of the diaries to the style of the year? Obviously, you can't do that. So, what information do we have about how God would write a book if he would write a book? We really have no information at all. Would he use many names for himself? Maybe yes, maybe no. Would he use a, a verb the same way every time? Maybe yes, maybe no. So the evidence bears on multiple human versus single human. It doesn't bear on divine authorship. <clears throat> same is true with contradictions. Human beings write books who want to communicate important things to, to other people. Typically don't put contradictions in their books. Of course, not that true for everyone. Um, murder mysteries to scatter contradictions through the book so that you'll be forced into thinking, should I go this way, should I go that way, and then they resolve the seeming contradictions at the end. Logic textbooks definitely have contradictions in them to test the logical powers of the reader. You assume that this isn't a murder mystery and this isn't a logic textbook. So then you say, a human being wouldn't put contradictions into his book. Now, so then the two sides of the contradiction naturally are thought of as two human authors. God? Would God put contradictions into his book? How would you know? Who told you? Where would you get the information? Same thing with redundancy. Now there is, is a form of literature in which, human literature in which you have redundancy, that's poetry. Poetry does make use of redundancy because of the effects that poetry wants to have. So you want to see it in spades, take a look at Edgar Allan Poe's uh, poem, The Bells. Every stanza ends with the word bells 17 times. By the time you're halfway through, you hear bells ringing. It's, it's just phenomenal. <coughs> okay, human beings do it in some texts, but in the Encyclopedia Britannica, they will not do it. And the Wall Street Journal, they will not do it. Because we know the purpose is that people have for writing books. Do we know the purpose God has for writing his book so well that we can predict that he wouldn't put redundancies in the book? How do we know that? Finally, what about texts that are tied to certain particular times and circumstances? Well, if you think that these texts have to be composed on the basis of the events that take place, then indeed you'll have them spread out through history, composed at different times. But if God is writing them, he knows the future. He can write a text today whose relevance is only apparent 400 years later. He has no difficulty in doing that. So, if you're talking about human authorship and you say one human author could not have known 400 years before that 400 years later there would be a king. So, he couldn't have written that. The one who wrote the text about the king must have written it later. I understand that. That's multiple human authorship against single human authorship. But God's authorship is just not relevant. It's not relevant. So, when you think about the evidence for the documentary hypothesis and you put it in the context of competition, it's only relevant to multiple human versus single human. It's not relevant to multiple human versus God. Is this clear? I mean, I hope this is very simple and clear and obvious. Now, why is this important? I've written this on my, blog, on my, my website. And I got a letter from a guy who said, Oh, everybody knows that. You know, what biblical scholar thought he was right, arguing against God? Okay, okay. But I saw with my own eyes when I was in college that students who go into these classes and they walk in with the yarmulke and they walk out without a yarmulke. They walk in keeping kosher and they walk out eating cheeseburgers because the professor proved that there are multiple authors at different times put together by an editor. He proved that. No one bothered to explain to those poor students that the whole exercise was based on the unspoken and unargued assumption that God's out of the picture we're not talking about God. We're only talking about people. No one said that to them. So I think it's worth saying. So that people don't get, get uh, pulled into this trap that the whole exercise has nothing to do with divine authorship. Are we together? Okay. That's one important uh, element. Now, there are also weaknesses in the evidence or the theory as a whole vis-a-vis the competition where it's applied between multiple human versus single human. The evidence isn't all that good even there. First of all, is another what I think of as a big point, 
um, who is this editor supposed to be? Who is he? The official story is no one knows. No one knows. There's no direct evidence who the editor is. I think that's already pretty bad. I'll show you why. Maybe the most popular candidate is Ezra. Ezra led the return of the, Ezra and Nehemiah led the return of some portion of the Babylonian exiles back to the, to, to the land of Israel, reestablished the temple, and he was an authority figure for the people in Babylon. The two comprised a considerable majority of the Jewish population at the time. There was a population in Alexandria, Egypt also, but he had the authority, he had the weight, he had the significance of reestablishing the temple to be able to pull this off, to take these different documents and combine them together. So the picture we are supposed to have is this. You have several different groups. Each group has its name of God, conception of God. Each group has its own distinct holy texts. The texts agree in some particulars and disagree in other particulars. And Ezra comes along and unifies the whole thing. And there isn't a whisper in the historical record of this event at all. Not a whisper anywhere. That's why these people, the people who believe in biblical criticism, have to make this as a speculation. Because there isn't a whisper of it. Now, I suggest to you that that's incredible. I think it's more incredible intuitively than the existence of God. After all, you're talking about a gigantic history, uh, event in Jewish history. You have several different groups, each with its own fragmentary texts, each with its own fragmentary picture of God. Then a person of great authority pulls them all together. Was there no discussion? Was there no debate? Were there no holdouts who said, No, my fragment's right and you're wrong. Your name of God is, a, is, is, is phony. There is no God with your name. Only with my name. Nothing? Zero? The Jewish tradition records who instituted washing your hands before eating bread. But finally arriving at the text of God's word that's passed over in utter silence, how about a holiday to celebrate the final achievement of God's text? I think it's astonishing that they can hypothesize such a thing should happen without a, a single whisper of it in any historical record. I think that counts very strongly against the picture that they are proposing. Are we together? Okay, now let's take a look in some more detail at the pieces of evidence that they offer, and then I'll show you some other ones that are textual pieces which we'll go through also in detail. Names of God. Names of God should represent different conceptions of God and therefore different communities. Well, when this first was um, developed by two um, British, I'm sorry, German Protestant theologians in the 1880s, there was very little archaeology done of the ancient Near East at that time. And this was a Hypothesis, a guess, based on normal human psychology. Since then, a lot has been discovered about ancient religious, religious texts in the ancient Near East. And it turns out that multiple names for the gods was very common. One text had 65 names for one god. No one dreamt that there were really 65 fragmented groups. And someone sewed together 65 fragments in order to unify it. No one dreamt of that. There aren't any 65 groups. It was common to have more than one name for God. So that being the case, the fact that our text has four, five, or six names of God, depending on how you count, is not extravagant. If in the background you have one religious text, not ours, but from an ancient religion, that has 65 names, this apparently was a literary style. Not only is it a literary style, but the idea that they express, and this part of their idea is correct, that the different names do express different qualities that God has, so to speak. To jump from that to the idea that therefore each name must belong to a different community projects an attitude of utter um, contempt for those ancient people. You are so simplistic that you can only hold one idea in your head. The idea that there might be multiple features of God and the multiple features have to be 
coordinated into a complex so-called personality that's totally foreign, that would cast our ancestors on a par with the polytheisms and mythologies of the ancient world. I don't think that there's any reason to be to presuppose that our ancestors couldn't have been more sophisticated and thought of a single god as having different features, just like single human beings have different features. None of us is one-dimensional. Why should the creator of the created universe be one-dimensional? So that piece of, of evidence is, is very weak. Now, when you talk about shifting style, and, and they, they, ba- they based a great deal on this, the differences of style. A computer study was done in 1985. Okay, that's ancient history. It was done to measure the amount of stylistic variation that you have in the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis is where the whole study started. Um, is where the people in 1880, particularly the fellow in Wellhausen, started his analysis because there are severe shifts in style in the book of Genesis. So the thought was, if we can test it in the book of Genesis and see if it works or not, then we'll have good evidence as to whether it's reasonable or not. And this is what these computer scientists did. The main investigators were at the Technion, and they had some other people in other places as well. And of course, they weren't religious, because if they were religious, it would only be propaganda and and, and uh, phony and, and biased and everything else. But they weren't religious, so everything is objective and scientific and so on and so on. So here's what they did. They created a computer program to tally up variations in literary style. Make a numerical summation of variations in literary style. They tested the program in the following way. They took the works of a single author, approximately the length of Genesis in words, and they ran the program on those, on those stretches of text of a single author, and they tallied how uniform is the style of those texts. If I remember correctly, the level of uniformity varied from something like 70% to 4%. A single author does vary in style, it does happen. Writes different passages, changes over time. Not all authors write with exactly the same style as they go on. Fine. Then they tried the same program on a text that's composed of the writings of several different authors to see what the uniformity of style was in those texts. Uniformity of style was something like 0.00007. It was very, very low. The difference between texts of one author and texts of several authors, three, four, five authors, which is what the hypothesis is talking about, is gigantic. In terms of orders of magnitude, it was several orders of magnitude different, and for a statistical test, that's a very good test. Okay, so then they took the book of Genesis, and they applied the program to do a statistical study of the uniformity of literary style in Genesis, and it got higher uniformity than any of the single authors tested. That means, they concluded, if you're going to use literary style as your criterion of multiple authorship, you should definitely say that Genesis was written by one author. This book is still available. You can get it on Amazon. I have it on my my website. It's on a, a list of sources. So now, let me explain to you what my attitude is. I actually saw a, a, a news article, one of the news magazines, when this came out, which said, and this is a computer study, so this is objective. The other estimates were subjective because people are saying, I see lots of variation style, and so I think it must have been several authors. But this is a computer study, it's pure mathematics and, and, and computing machinery, so it's perfectly objective. Well... From the point of view of philosophy and mathematics and computer science, one could have one's reservations about a statement like that. After all, how do you make a numerical count of variations in style? In particular, if you program the computer to check 25 elements of style, do you weigh them all equally? Just count variations equally? Do you think think that verbs are more important than nouns? Verbs and nouns are more important than numbers. And if you say they're all equal, that's a decision made 
basically subjectively. And say, this is more important, that's less important. That's another decision made subjectively. So I'm not pledging allegiance to the computer study as if it's the final word. But I do say this. You have two groups of investigators, both of them are using the same criterion, literary style, and they're arising, they're arriving at opposite conclusions. I think that means that the method is not well founded. You apply what people call a method to the same material and you get opposite results, then there's something wrong with the method. And that means the method is simply not reliable. So I, I'm not impressed with the analysis in terms of style. Even to discriminate between multiple human authors and single human author. Even to discriminate between the two of those, I'm not impressed. Oh, well, God's authorship, as we, as we said, is simply out of the question. Are we together? Okay. Let's think about the redundancies and the, and the contradictions. Of course, contradictions and redundancies might be only apparent. They might be only apparent. It might require careful reading, careful attention to detail, to see whether they really are redundant or see whether they really are contradictory. Tomorrow, Mir Hashem, I will show you some examples of those where they claimed redundancy or, or um, contradiction. And I'll show you how careful reading will, will show you that it isn't really so. To, to state that something's a contradiction is not obvious. The words may sound that way, but if you pay careful attention to context, pay careful attention to the nuance, word order, you can often see that it's not really redundancy and um, and contradiction. As far as the, the times and the political developments are concerned, as I told you, if you have um, if you have um, prophecy, then that's a non-starter. Okay? Now, that will do inside tomorrow, but I wanted to end with one fairly extensive point for today. Um, there's a woman, I don't know if she's still alive or not, named Leah Broner. She wrote a book called Biblical Personalities and Archaeology. It's an old book, but it's still very useful. Where she took a look at the description of the style of life in the Torah and in later books. And she compared it with archaeology to see how much archaeology can shed light on the accuracy of what's written in these books about the style of life of the people at the time. My interest is in the five books of Moses. I'm not trained and never invested in reading the rest of the Tanakh. I read it here and there, but not, not. So I looked only at the portion that, that deals with that. And she, her thesis is that archaeology supports the details of life, which the book of Genesis uses, the beginning of the book of Exodus, used to describe the style of life of the patriarchs and the Jewish people during that period of time. Now, why is this important? Because there is a style of, of composition in ancient myths, a very common uh, style, which works like this. A group of people, a nation, need to have some account where they came from. What are their origins? Who were their ancestors? What did they do? And they have a motivation to glorify their ancestors. So they create a myth. The myth goes through stages in development, centuries, retelling, amending, adding, subtracting. Then they write it down. At a certain point, they write it down. And that's where these scriptures of these ancient peoples come from. Of course, we regard these things as, as false, just made up. How do we know in particular that they're false? There's one tool which is used quite widely, and that's called anachronism. You read in the, in the text that 500 years ago, ABC happened. Now, where does this text come from? This text was written really only 100 years before. Describing 400 years before. 400 years later is describing what happened 400 years before. Where did they get the information from? Well, a lot of it they're making up. It's a myth. Where do they get the information about the quality of life at that time? Well, there was no organized historical records. They took the quality of life at their own time, 400 years later, 
and projected it back 400 years. How can you tell that it's been projected back 400 years? You do some archaeology to dig up the, era, the time 400 years before and see what the quality of life was, and you see discrepancies. And then you say, well, this, what they're describing for 400 years before existed in their own time. It didn't exist 400 years before. So they took them in their time and they, pr they projected it on the back. For example, suppose the book says 400 years before there was a the big battle with bows and arrows. You dig up the time uh, archaeologically and there were no bows and arrows. They weren't invented yet. Bows and arrows you find in archaeology really invented only 100 years before the text was written. So here you have people. They're making up myths about their ancestors. They've been living with bows and arrows for three generations. They don't remember when it was invented. How long? You know, three generations is a long time. So that being the case, when they make up the story about 400 years before about their ancestors, they put bows and arrows in. We have bows and arrows, but our ancestors are less than we? No, for sure not. They definitely had it as well. And then when you do the archaeology for the period 400 years before, you see right away that they made it up because there weren't any bows and arrows at that time. That's called anachronism. That's one of the key methods you have for showing that these myths are really myths. Where was the habitation of the people? You know, what was the social organization of the people? If uh, you're living at a time when you have a triumvirate, as it was in Rome for a period of time, three rulers together, and you project back 400 years before that they had a triumvirate also, and then you do the archaeology and find out they had a single king, so you know what they did. They took their, their reality and they projected it backwards. And that shows that it's not true, that it's a myth. What Leah Bronner and later studies show is that you can't make that argument for Genesis. Because the descriptions in Genesis are accurate for the period of time described, accurate in details which we have no reason to think would be preserved. Accurate about small details of life which... There's no reason to think that would be preserved for later generations that someone could say, okay, let's look in the history books and see. I'm writing a historical novel. Let's look up the history books and see what the historical conditions were. And I'll write them into my novel to make sure that it's you know, historically realistic. But that's simply not credible. So what you have is a conclusion that this book must have been written at the time that the events took place or written by someone who knew very well what the events were when the events were taking place, the conditions of life. Otherwise, you couldn't explain why you got it right. So I'll give you some examples. All the action in the book of Genesis takes place in the south of Israel. There's no action in the Galilee area. As a matter of fact, during that period of time, the Galilee was not settled. Only the south was settled. Broner points out that if you think it was written 500 years later, as some scholars pretend to think, at that time, the Galilee was settled. So it would have been very natural for them to project backwards this false picture that the Galilee was settled and put some of the action there as well. But in fact, they don't do that. The price of a slave, Joseph is sold for 20 pieces of silver. It happens that at that period of time, when Joseph was sold, that was an average price for, uh, for a slave. Before that, slaves were cheaper. After that, slaves got more and more expensive. It was made up hundreds of years later. Somebody kept a record a record for hundreds of years what the average prices of slaves were year by year? It's just not, not credible. Names that you find in the book of Genesis are found in inscriptions during that period of time and not later. Uh, the trade routes that are, that are described are the trade routes that were current at that time. The War of Four Kings and Five Kings, about which many have made false uh, claims, in terms of archaeology, we'll get to that in Hashem. The War of Four Kings and Five Kings, it has been uh, verified that at that time, there were no big empires. At that time, there were small city-states, which, for time to time, for purposes, banded together for various, for various purposes, and then, and then disintegrated in, in, the, in Israel and Mesopotamia. There were just small city-states. So the picture of four kings banding together to have a war against five kings is very typical for that time. Later, there were big empires. There were no four kings against five kings because you had Egypt, you had Assyria, you had Babylon, you had big, big empires. So such a, such a picture uh, would not have been realistic. Uh, the Torah records that Jacob died in Egypt in a bed. 
died in a bed. That's because Egypt had beds, and, and Israel did not have beds. That's the situation. So therefore, the, at that time, it was important to record that because it was significant about the time that they were describing. Joseph is becoming second in command to the, to the Pharaoh. The precise procedure, putting a, a, a collar around his neck and uh, giving him a chariot uh, that is pictured in hieroglyphics from that period of time. So Broder says, if you're talking about the accuracy of describing the period of time, the accuracy is no question correct. Now, if you tell us to people, people who have dabbled in these areas and may have read one or two things without checking them out in detail, uh, you may hear a complaint that there's definitely one anachronism, and that is the camel. Patriarchs are described as using camels as domestic um, tamed animals for transport. <coughs> and they will tell you that camels were not domesticated um, in this region uh, until much later. Well, first of all, if you take the larger region, we have definite evidence of domestication of animals, uh, of camels, before the patriarchs. Certainly Mesopotamia, hundreds of years before the patriarchs. So, one critic says, well, they weren't widely used in Israel at that time. If they were in Israel at all, they were only had by the rich and powerful, and therefore, the patriarchs certainly didn't have them, and there, can you imagine this? The patriarchs certainly didn't have them, and therefore, the text which says they did is just an anachronism. Well, excuse me, but our text says that our ancestors were rich and powerful. Abraham with his confederates could fight a war and defeat four kings. They were rich and powerful, they had thousands of followers. If the camels could be used by the rich and powerful, from our point of view, it would be very natural for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to have camels. Um, so that being the case, if someone challenges you with the camels, the answer is you're relying on an, an incorrect inference. They just now found some camels from the 10th century. <laughs> it's, it's, it's unbelievable. And they write, this is the earliest camel bones we found, so camels were not used here before. The intelligent reader says, what? They're the earliest camel bones we found, so they weren't used there before? Couldn't be they were used there and you didn't find them yet? Couldn't be? Impossible? If they're used only by the rich and powerful? How many are you expecting to find? What they found was an area where they thought they were bred, where they, were, they became a commercial, a commercial uh, enterprise. Sure, maybe there was no commercial enterprise. Maybe the camels that were used here were imported from Mesopotamia, and they weren't bred here. Fine. And that would mean they're very small, a very small amount, only for the rich and powerful. Are you expecting to find a needle in a haystack? So you don't find a needle in the same well, there's none in the haystack? Well, that's, that's the way it goes. At any rate, this, this serves as an antidote to a very, very common type of thought that myths are based on anachronisms, and that's what you expect to find. And that would show that the Torah also, God forbid, is, is also anachronistic. It isn't anachronistic. That being the case, that can't be used as an argument against the reliability of the text. Okay, tomorrow uh, I'll review some of this, if you see if the questions have arisen in the meantime, and we'll also take a look inside the text at some of the particular citations they use to support their point of view.